welcome to Inside the BACB, the official podcast of the Behavior Analyst Certification Board. Hi, everyone. I'm Melissa Nosick, the Deputy CEO of the BACB, and I'll be your host again for today's episode. I am really excited to share this new episode of Inside the BACB with you. Today, we are here to talk about a special project that we've been working on that was initiated as a way to support growth in many subspecialty practice areas of applied behavior analysis. It ended up being a multi-year initiative that included more than 40 subject matter expert volunteers from multiple areas of practice, donating their time in a variety of ways. For today's discussion, I couldn't be happier to spend some time on the podcast with two of my very favorite collaborators. When we work together, it's always on projects that we value a great deal, and it was so fun to bring this initiative to life together and have some great new resources for the profession as a result. So please welcome Dr. Jim Carr, our Chief Executive Officer at the BACB, and Dr. Molly Luke, our Director of Certificate Services. Hey, everyone. Hey, everyone. I'm also really excited to talk about this project now that we have completed all the activities. So to provide some further context for this special episode on subspecialty areas of practice in ABA, at the BACB, we think about infrastructure of a profession a lot because of how important it is to be strategically developing in a somewhat ordinal way. For example, training programs have to teach individual skills to practice before it will be recognized as a service that's needed, and then jobs become available after that. Uh, to individuals that are trained in that skill. So the subspecialty practice area of autism services did not exactly follow this ideal ordinal plan. And there certainly have been some growing pains as a result of that. So it was a pretty natural thing to recognize that there were needs in other areas. And I'm not gonna go into that too much because Jim is gonna share more about that in a minute. But as a note, we're using the term subspecialty throughout this podcast because it's akin to the way it's used in other professions like medicine, where there are subspecialties in oncology, internal medicine, cardiothoracic, et cetera. And the designation represents an individual having specialized training in that area of practice. So in ABA, the subspecialty practice area where most ABA practitioners work is autism and developmental disabilities. There is quite disproportionate representation in that particular area for a plethora of reasons. I'll mention a few, strong consumer demand, lots of education and experience opportunities, research, funding mechanisms, and workforce, just to name a few. Other subspecialty practice areas are only beginning to grow in number and in their infrastructure, and they haven't yet had the confluence of variables that could result in like massive growth as it happened in autism and developmental disabilities. So a focus on developing infrastructure to fill in those gaps might circumvent some of the growing pains associated with the rapid onset of demand that we saw in autism and developmental disabilities. So Jim, with that context, that was a bit long-winded, could you share some more specific information about our activities on this particular project? Yeah, definitely. So about five years ago, we noticed that there were a few resources that could be used to easily disseminate information about you know, the value of ABA in areas other than autism and intellectual disabilities. Now, this kind of dissemination is really important. You know, Not only do we need to educate the world about the breadth of applied behavior analysis, but we also need to educate new and prospective students about this as well. So in an effort to help out with this void, our board authorized resources to do two things. First, we pulled together experts from a variety of ABA subspecialty areas. This group met in Denver back in uh, 2016, and we met for a day, and we asked them to brainstorm ideas about potentially helpful resources that could be developed uh, to help uh, disseminate and, and let people know just how broad ABA is. And uh, after that meeting, uh, we've spent the last few years actually developing some of these resources. Now, before we continue, I just want to stress that this was a purely an, an altruistic effort of our board of directors. We didn't do all of this as cover to develop new specialty credentials or anything like that. Uh, maybe something we look into down the road, but it's not on our radar now. We just simply noticed a vacuum of important information. And over the last few years, we've attempted to modestly help fill it. Thanks for that, Jim. Molly, your turn. Can you take us back in time to one of my personal favorite meetings ever at the BACV? It was the 2016 initial subspecialty work group. 
I'm happy to. As you mentioned, back in 2016, we gathered representatives from several subspecialty areas in behavior analysis to brainstorm a list of resources. The list of resources were focused on increasing awareness of the subspecialty practice areas and further supporting the development of training in those areas. And I really can't speak highly enough about the members of this work group because it was a group of superstars. So for instance, we had Dr. Janet Twyman representing the education subspecialty area, Dr. Pat Fryman representing behavioral pediatrics, Dr. Jonathan Baker representing behavioral gerontology, among many others. It was really a fantastic group. So the work group collectively recommended a really thoughtful list of resources that could serve as critical dissemination and support mechanisms for each subspecialty practice area. After the meeting, our board of directors reviewed and approved the BACB to facilitate the development of a subset of those resources. So in the remainder of today's podcast, we're going to highlight the resources that have been developed over the last few years and share some ideas for products that might be more appropriate for other groups, but were really important ideas and could be really valuable resources for the profession. And before we dig in, I did want to reiterate the sentiments that Jim and Melissa have both shared, which is that our role in this initiative was only to serve as facilitators in the development of the resources. We relied on, as Melissa mentioned, over 40 subject matter experts working in various subspecialty practice areas that shared their expertise to develop content. With that, we would like to take this opportunity to thank each person working in these growing subspecialty practice areas that volunteered their valuable time to develop these materials. It was so much fun to work with them because it was an opportunity to see how thoughtful and passionate the subject matter experts were about conveying the research and impacts of their workforce on improving lives through behavior analysis. It's also intentional that none of the materials produced have BACB branding and can be freely used by anyone. There's no copyright requirements. We encourage anyone that can benefit from them to disseminate, use them in teaching courses, post, share them, um, or whatever might be helpful. And the show notes of this episode, you can find all of the links for these resources that we're going to be talking about. Thanks, Molly. So it's time to get to the actual resources and how they can be used, the most important part. Jim, would you please do the honor of kicking us off? Absolutely. So one of our resource projects was to produce a series of one page fact sheets for a variety of subspecialty areas. The idea is that when someone wanted to share information with relevant stakeholders about a certain practice area, say behavioral gerontology, for an example, there'd now be a, a brief user friendly resource to share. So what we did to start is we created a structure for the fact sheet and what it includes is a, you know, kind of a key summary of the area. And we tried to get those written at, at a level where they would be pretty accessible to most folks. Uh, we've got key literature resources uh, in the fact sheet and URLs to websites for additional information, including ABAI special interest group when they exist. So we also included the first known article or book in the subspecialty area. And I think this is an important addition because it permits individuals to say, you know, for example, behavior analysts have been working in this area since 1972. I think that's a particularly powerful bit of information to have at the ready when you're communicating to various stakeholders. So once we locked down the structure of the fact sheet, we invited small teams of leaders from a variety of subspecialty areas to actually provide the content. Uh, so we just gave them the shell, they provided the content, and then we did some, some editing on the back end. So we now have fact sheets from 12 different subspecialty areas. They're located on the About Behavior Analysis page of the BACB website. And there's a link to this page in our show notes for this episode. And you'll notice when you look at the fact sheets that they all have the same layout and design uh, elements, but different color schemes. Uh, and as Molly mentioned, there's no BACB or organizational branding on this document. They're meant to be shared widely and freely, and we ultimately hope to see some of these resources on other websites. Now, what's interesting is around the same time this project was unfolding, I had a state legislator contact me, and he was looking for a, a, a user-friendly summary of all the different ABA practice areas, and he was trying to counter the claims of some of his colleagues in the legislature that ABA was only a treatment for autism. 
So I said, yeah, absolutely. I'm sure we have something. We'll, we'll do some research and get back to you. And after a couple of days of searching, what I realized is we actually didn't have in our profession a document that actually laid out all the various practice areas in kind of a professional looking way and, and in a user friendly uh, manner. So unfortunately, I had to get back to, to this individual and let him know that unfortunately we didn't have anything official, but I put together something in the moment to, to try to kind of bridge the gap. So later we're working in this initiative and we decided to create such a resource, of course, after it was needed at that time. So what we did is we took all the summary descriptions from the various fact sheets and created a single document that summarizes all of the main ABA subspecialty areas. Now, we didn't have this resource when we originally needed it, but we certainly have it now. We've already made good use of it in similar situations. So this resource is also located on our About Behavior Analysis page with the fact sheets. And again, we have links to this information in the show notes. Thanks, Jim. That's an interesting story. And I definitely have heard from a number of people how useful the fact sheets have already been to them. Uh, I thought we could go next to a functionally similar project. Molly, it would be great if you could share the video project next. Ah, yes, this was a fun one. So the original work group also mentioned that similar to the fact sheets, there aren't very many freely available presentations that provide an overview to a subspecialty area. Usually the videos that you see are more focused on a specific line of research or a specific topic within that area. So we facilitated the development of a series of one hour presentations and each presentation provided an overview of one area. So each presentation included the scope of the subspecialty area, some notable research, where to go if you wanted more information. And we currently have nine of these videos covering a broad range of areas from environmental sustainability to OBM or organizational behavior management and interventions for child maltreatment. And each presentation was developed and presented by an expert in that area. The work group thought these one hour videos could be helpful in a number of ways. So for instance, they could be added to an applied behavior analysis course where students could watch one video each week to learn about various subspecialty areas. And it's almost like the students had a guest lecture from the ultimate expert in that area, from John Austin in OBM to Janet Twyman in education. And all nine of these videos are posted for free on our behavior analysis page and on YouTube. And again, you can access these through the session notes as well. Thanks, Molly. Yeah, the video project was definitely fun to watch unfold and, and develop. Melissa, would you please share a few projects that you facilitated? Absolutely. I'll share two small projects that we worked on in this series. The first was a project for the development of a training directory in a practice area. The goal of this project was to provide a resource for special interest groups or even organizations to collect information from their members on companies offering training, internships, or externships. So individuals could actually find experience and training opportunities in that area of practice more easily. One of the barriers we identified in the initial work group was that even if someone learns about and wants to get training in a particular area, it isn't easy to find a mentor or supervisor or even a training program that offers experience in the area. So we created the task analysis for creating a simple training directory map that can be hosted and shared on a web page. The second small project I'll mention was the development of a general um, guidance document for behavior analysts that are interested in either re-specializing or acquiring skills to move into a different subspecialty area of practice. The document that we developed includes guidance in a couple of areas. I'll mention a few. So the first, familiarizing yourself with the research in that particular area planning for acquiring the education, training, and skills necessary for practicing in that area, and then developing a timeline for it. Lastly, determining how to maintain competence in those skills via continuing education. So this resource was developed as a general guide that outlines each of the areas that you should consider if you're attempting to re-specialize in a different subspecialty area. 
For example, some of the areas of practice have additional regulatory requirements that should be considered in the planning phases. So the general resource should really be adapted to the new subspecialty area where you're trying to begin practicing. We disseminated these resources to the ABAI special interest groups that were relevant, and we also have the documents available on our website. Molly, do you want to take the next resource? Sure. Um, another resource that was recently developed is a task analysis for writing and disseminating important events through a press release. So going back to Melissa's description about the factors that led to behavior analysis being well known as a treatment for autism, it wasn't just that there was a big study conducted and published, that information really needed to get out to the public. So one way to disseminate new research and service programs to wider audiences is by writing and disseminating a press release about the event. Well-written and distributed press releases could be published by the press and potentially lead to interviews or other networking and dissemination opportunities. So this resource provides a quick guide for behavior analysts interested in learning more about how to do this. As with other resources, this one can also be found in the show notes. Thanks, Molly. You know, it's not uncommon at conferences to see sessions and, and hear comments about, you know, ABA needing to go beyond autism. That sentiment's always bothered me a little bit because ABA has been beyond autism and we've been there for decades. The issue is that the infrastructure in these other subspecialty areas is just nowhere near as robust as the one that we have in the autism area. And the reason that there's been such growth and development in the autism area is because of a handful of critical events. Melissa alluded to these earlier. You know, these include the publication of a large in study that was Lovas uh, 1987. You know, and this study had easily consumable and important primary dependent variables that could be appreciated by non-behavior analysts. A study like that happening today in a, in a certain subspecialty area would be a great candidate for that press release uh, that uh, Molly just mentioned. What we also had though was not just that study, but we also had parent-led dissemination efforts and these included Catherine Maurice's Let Me Hear Your Voice book, and then just the tremendous funding advocacy of Autism Speaks. And so, you know, all of these primary events and a handful of others led to this enormous demand for ABA services and autism, and that's what directly led to growth in the area. Now, other subspecialty areas will hopefully eventually have their own growth story, but it's going to be a different one. There may be some similar elements, but it's very likely that there will be kind of different story beats there. So I don't think it's going to be possible to simply replicate what happened in the autism area, but it's clear to me that any growth in a subspecialty area is likely to involve the people who are already doing that work. So we thought it might be useful to give some subspecialty groups time to have a big conversation about their areas and to do some strategic planning for the future. Now, a number of years ago at the BACB, we used Dr. Peter Doms to help facilitate our strategic plan. And since then, because he was just so uh, incredibly useful to us, a number of behavior analysis organizations have used him to help with their strategic plans as well. Now, Peter's a unique resource because he has a doctorate in OBM, but he happens to specialize in strategic planning for organizations. So what we did is we arranged to have Peter facilitate strategic planning sessions with groups of experts from a variety of subspecialty areas. Now, BACB staff were not present for any of the activities. We just put Peter together with the subspecialty area representatives and let them take it from there. So, Molly, would you tell our listeners a little bit more about what this project entailed? Yeah. You know, Dr. Doms usually provides strategic planning with people at the same organization. So this was a little bit of a unique situation in that the people involved were all working at different places. And really the main way that they were tied together was that they were all involved in that same subspecialty area. But he was really excited about playing a part in helping these subspecialty areas further progress in behavior analysis. So he developed a slightly modified approach. So Dr. Doms met with each group separately over two meetings. Each group would identify common barriers for the subspecialty area, concrete steps that they could take to address those barriers and metrics to evaluate success towards that plan. So for instance, they might identify that it can be difficult to find other behavior analysts who are working in that area, 
or there are limited educational or funding opportunities for behavior analysts in the area. So based on those barriers, they came up with action items. This might be to develop a directory of behavior analysts working in that area or identifying funding sources at the local, state, or federal levels that could be pursued. Dr. Doms then provided the plans to the people who had participated so they could take it back to their colleagues in the area for further discussion and to start working on the plan. And I have heard from several people who participated that they really valued the systematic approach that he took and the ability to have concrete steps in a plan for their group. And I know many have already accomplished several steps on that plan. So for instance, one of the groups identified that the first step to getting the plan completed is to create a formal group for their subspecialty area, and they quickly got that established. That's really fantastic that uh, that this exercise led to the formation of a group in a subspecialty area where there had not been one before. Thanks, guys. It sounds like that activity was really informative and helpful, and that was the goal. So now there were a number of other ideas for resources that we didn't produce. Molly, can you share that list? And maybe someone listening will tackle one of those other projects for us. Sure. Similar to the idea for fact sheets and videos, the original work group thought it could be helpful to have a series of peer review publications on various subspecialty practice areas. So each paper could provide, for instance, an overview of the area, a brief description of a few studies in the area, and how people might move into that area. That's a really good idea. You know, this would make a really good special section in a journal. If we have any possible guest editors out there who might be interested in approaching a journal about mm -hmm. this kind of section, again, kind of like we did the fact sheets, you could establish a structure of each article, invite someone from a subspecialty area to write that article, and then they would all kind of have the same shape, but mm -hmm. obviously different content. And this might also be a nice supplement to the fact sheets because someone might be surprised to hear that behavior analysts have been working in a certain area since the late 1960s, and you provide the fact sheet. If they're interested, they might want something more. This kind of journal article doesn't exist in most subspecialty areas because if you're already working in the area, the idea of writing a journal article for non-behavior analysts is probably not high in your priority list. So we have you know, lots of scholarly reviews of the research literature and original work. But when it comes time to kind of like a, a nicely composed article published in a scientific journal that simply lays out, hey guys, yeah. here's what we're doing in this area. We have virtually none of those. Uh, and so a special section might be nice and they would pair nicely with those videos in a university course as well. That's a great idea. That is a great idea. There was also a discussion about how powerful Dr. Richard Fox's Harry video was in showing how behavior analysis can change someone's life. They thought that a contemporary and professionally produced video on the impact of behavior analysis for pre-treatment to post-treatment in a specific subspecialty area, so for instance, early and intensive behavioral interventions could also be a really valuable resource. That's a great idea. And I think that'd be a very helpful dissemination resource. My guess is that most of our listeners have never seen the Harry video, but the, this was produced in the late 70s and it documents the treatment of an adult male with an intellectual disability. He was aggressive and had self-injurious behavior and they really showed from baseline through treatment to after, I think it was like 37 minutes that particular video, it's too dated to be a, a useful dissemination resource today, but it really showed the tremendous power of applied behavior analysis. And we don't really have uh, videos like that today. I mean, essentially it's kind of like a little documentary. I think it'd be great if we could get a professionally produced yeah. uh, documentary that really shows a specific client outcome, you know, from start to end. Yeah, like an updated contemporary depiction of treatment. Yeah. Another resource to piggyback on Melissa's mention about the training directory is a subspecialty expert directory of people in the area who could be used as informational resource. So for instance, it could be um, someone who would be interested in doing a guest lecture or presenting at a conference or consulting. 
And this one could be done in conjunction with the training directory or um, as a separate directory. This would also be a really helpful resource to state associations who are trying to diversify their program schedules each year. I could see them, you know, referring to a list like this to find a speaker on particular topics. Great idea. They also suggested creating model syllabi for survey courses in each subspecialty area and providing that freely to anyone who wanted to develop coursework. So I know, for instance, the Behaviorist for Social Responsibility Special Interest Group has done something similar for courses in environmental sustainability. So I could see this being developed with a lot of other subspecialty areas. Yeah, this would be a great resource. Uh, obviously, this would come from the subspecialty area itself, maybe hosted on the website, and then they could provide a variety of model syllabi, you know, like an undergraduate course in OBM or a graduate course. And in addition, I think it might also be useful for an organization to create a model syllabus for a survey course of the subspecialty areas. And I don't know about you guys, but I think it's relatively rare for a graduate program in behavior analysis to devote a whole course yeah. to the various practice areas. Probably even rarer to see that at the undergraduate level, but honestly, Having a, a senior level undergraduate course that covered, you know, like a different practice area per week. I know Alice Dickinson used to teach something like this at Western Michigan University. When students are just getting interested in behavior analysis, that'd be kind of the ideal point right. to show them uh, all the different areas that are available. And that might influence their decisions about graduate school. Right. All right. And finally, because there is a lot more that goes into moving into a new area than just knowing how to apply behavior analysis to that population or to the problem, they also suggested developing and offering training resources. So, for instance, webinars or workshops on the unique non-behavioral aspects and skills associated with that specific area. So for instance, an introduction to the funding streams, the relevant policies, all of those could be really beneficial knowledge to know. Another great idea. Thanks, Molly. Yeah, I really do hope that some of our listeners might be able to pick up some of these ideas and help bring them to fruition. So to wrap things up, I hope the listeners enjoyed hearing about this side project of ours over the last few years. To recap, here are the resources that we've helped develop around ABA subspecialty areas. We have uh, fact sheets for 12 areas, a document that describes all the major areas. Uh, we've got high quality one hour introductory videos for nine of the areas. We help facilitate strategic planning sessions for six areas. We've developed a guidance document for creating a training directory for an area, a guidance document for behavior analysts looking to move from one area to another, and a guidance document on writing press releases to share newsworthy events within an area. Now, again, all of these resources were created without BACB branding, and we hope that our listeners will help widely disseminate them and, and even house them. As we all know, ABA is incredibly powerful and it's been shown to be effective in many different areas, but I think we all need to work together to help get the word out about this. And for those listeners who are passionate about ABA being applied outside of the autism area, well, I strongly encourage you to pick your favorite application area, find the behavior analysts who are already working in it. There probably aren't that many of them and I'm sure they would appreciate your support. Now, this was a time-limited project for the BACB, and we don't have any plans for additional resource development, although you know, I can't rule out any down the road. In the meantime, we hope that these modest resources are helpful in disseminating to the public and to some of our junior behavior analysts you know, information about the really great work that our behavior analysts have been doing in many different areas and have been doing for a long time. Thank you so much for sharing this information, Jim and Molly, for joining me on the podcast today and to our listeners. And I also want to give two more shout outs, one to all the subject matter expert contributors to these projects and the other to the individuals paving the path for behavior analysis to help people in areas of practice where there is currently a pretty small workforce. We really appreciate you and the work you're doing. As always, thank you for listening and be sure to check out the show notes for relevant links to all the resources that we have discussed in the podcast today. Goodbye for now. Take care, everyone. See ya. 
Thank you for listening to Inside the BACB. Don't miss future episodes. Subscribe now.